I now request our coordinator, DST Center for Policy Research at Punjab University, Chandigarh, Professor Nirmala Chongtham, for formal welcome address and setting the context of the floor. Over to you, Professor Nirmala. Thank you, Dr. Radhika. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, very, wish a very uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, respected Professor Manmohan Gupta, Coordinator, Chandigarh Region uh, Innovation Knowledge Cluster and Co-Coordinator, DST uh, Center for Policy Research, Punjab University, Chandigarh. Our esteemed speaker, Professor Rakesh Basant, uh, Professor of Economics, Dean Alumni and External Relations, uh, JSW Chair, Professor of, uh, of Innovation and Public Policy, IIM Ahmedabad, uh, faculty members, researchers, scientists, students, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of DST, uh, Center for Policy Research, Punjab University, Chandigarh, it is indeed a great pleasure for me to extend a warm welcome to all. And uh, uh, today we are indeed fortunate to have with us Professor Rakesh Pasan, uh, who is a professor of economics. And he will be talking on the black box innovation and public policy uh, in India, which is a topic which is very pertinent to the mandate of our center. Thank you, Professor Bashan, for sparing your valuable time. And uh, we would also like to congratulate you for uh, congratulate Professor Bashan for his recently public, uh, published book, uh, or, like he said, 23rd August uh, this year. Uh, the Black Box Innovation and Public Policy in India, which analyzes the impact on innovation of public policies, including those that are related to industry, trade, uh, R&D, foreign direct investment, intellectual property rights, startup, and higher education. Uh, a highly distinguished academician and administra uh, administrator, we are indeed privileged to have the opportunity to have Professor Rakesh Basan to discuss his views about innovation and public policy in India. For our young students uh, who, are, uh, who are with us today, I would just like to mention that in science, economics, and engineering, a black box is a system which can be viewed in terms of its input and output without any knowledge of its internal workings or the possible interactions with the environment. Uh, we all know that innovations are the key driver, drivers of the economy of the country and Professor Basant uh, will deliberate upon the policies India should adopt for fostering innovation. So uh, on the onset, before we start this, I would uh, uh, I have I would like to now invite Professor Gupta, Coordinator uh, Crick and Co-Coordinator co DST uh, Pol Center for Policy Research to give a special address. Professor Gupta, please. Professor Nirmala. Chongtham, Professor Basan, members of the Policy Research Center and uh, who are members who are attending the webinar. A very good afternoon to all of you. I feel very much privileged to be in the presence of a very distinguished academician who is going to speak us about his latest book, uh, which is related to innovation. Uh, let me mention that I am not an expert in this area, but I would do venture before you to put forth some of my ideas. Uh, as a theoretical thesis, I have gathered uh, over the years talking to several uh, distinguished scientists, including many Nobel laureates, and of course uh, my own uh, participation in research activity, which is still continuing, where I consider innovation, whether it is in science or in public life or in uh, industrial activity or in economics, it is innovation, and uh, the basic human mind acts in the same manner. So having uh, mentioned about this premises, I would like to say when we try to create uh, this Chandigarh region innovation knowledge cluster, I try to go through several clusters in the world. And let me mention, you might be knowing it, that there are 40 clusters. And 40 clusters all over the world almost produce 60% of the GDP of the world. So that is the importance of innovation and knowledge creation. So after having gone through that, like uh, Silicon Valley and then Shanghai cluster, and then uh, there are Boston cluster. I was in uh, Harvard University, so I am aware about the Boston uh, academic life and the uh, industrial life also. So what I find that uh, uh, if we have to, India is, of course, uh, India has to do it. If we don't do it, then uh, 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 things will be very difficult for us. I look at this way, that we have to produce in the universities job creators and not job seekers. 
if we have to produce job seekers and job creators then innovation and knowledge creation is the only handle available to us if we have to scale it up very fast so the way i look at innovation is the following that uh, just to see there are two kinds of innovation from my perspective uh, of course i would like to listen to your views detailed views and more academically illustrious views that there is a disruptive a disruptive innovation and a usual innovation or incremental innovation disruptive innovation generally comes from people who are outside the field because they have to take a quantum stamp and people who are already working in the field at least in science i find we can only make incremental advances in the area not a quantum uh, you can say uh, jump in the innovation so i won't be talking about that it's a very complicated topic so it will require a lot of time but however from normal innovation uh, the basic aim was first to create an uh, area or first to create an uh, some kind of uh, platform where experts from different areas can you can say it have informal discussion because it is believed uh, generally believed that cross fertilization of ideas or sharing of ideas mixing up or you can say creating interdisciplinary activity does lead to a lot of innovation this is true across all fields i am not sure about economics so i am not i won't like to mention about that for a expert on economics but in most of the sciences and other things my experience says that uh, when you add two fields there is always a possibility of innovation so that is the first thing first requirement that uh, an informal kind of kind of atmosphere has to be created now once there are informal discussion we have experts appreciating each other and they start respecting each other after that once you have it, you can say a group of experts from different areas respecting each other's ideas then there has to be formal discussion or formal presentation where one can uh, discuss uh, and uh, go deep into the ideas of various side and what are the possibilities in the interdisciplinary areas now interdisciplinary area can be science and social sciences also let me tell you i have worked uh, done some work on that and talk to some people economics of course is a very broad area so anything can uh, put in science can also join with economics environment can join with economics and of course uh, other things can also join with economics so then of course uh, the most the key thing for innovation i personally consider is the passionate people if you can identify few passionate experts then they can be pushed to have some kind of joint projects some kind of uh, Uh, we can push for those proposals which can be very innovative and at times disruptive innovation can also be there if we have uh, passionate people so i would say that if you follow it up then of course uh, once you have i have seen it happening in chandigarh area earlier let me tell you i am a physicist i never talk to biologist i never talk to economist i never talk to see uh, this uh, business chandigarh business school is part of uh, uh, this innovation knowledge cluster i never talk to engineers but once we started talking then i found that there are several areas where we can fill up the gaps where we can add something new and so on and so forth i have seen doctors talking to see doctors are busy people so very difficult to have them there but i found doctors also talking to engineers and no wonder that we have already some projects in the cross discipline although i wanted this to really make a progress but the government of india has already taken note of it and several cities are following this pattern i am of course not satisfied with the progress i wanted a quantum jump uh, of uh, showing something to the world that we have really achieved but i find that the idea really works so these are some of the few ideas uh, uh, which i just wanted to put across you and uh, and let me tell you that i am also working on a area uh, like as i mentioned i have some interest in capital market so i am working in that kind of thing which can really have a you can say huge impact on the country's uh, future it can really be a disruptive innovation in the sense that india can really make a quantum jump uh, in its gdp and maybe in 10 years or 15 years we can become world leader in the uh, you say economic field so because that requires a completely disruptive innovation so uh, i am working on some of those ideas and maybe someday when i am crystallize those ideas i would be happy to share with people like you have input from more experts and then how we can really put it but i am convinced that uh, uh, this that idea uh, is totally innovative and totally disruptive can really work thank you with these brief remarks so we would be very keen to uh, 
uh, hear you. Of course, I'm sorry if uh, I have overstepped my jurisdiction before an expert in the area because I have great regard for experts in different area. I know it's very, very difficult to become expert. Now, if I am an expert in my own area of research activity, I know how much hard work I have to put in to, be re to reach at that level. So with these brief remarks, I would like to uh, hear uh, your views on uh, expert, particularly on all these matters. Thank you very much, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity to be here. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, sir, for this uh, insightful uh, introduction about CRICS and its activities. And the CRICS indeed is a great example of collaborative work by sharing the resources to facilitate students and researchers in and around Chandigarh. And we look forward for your guidance in future too and feedback in policy making. So thank you, Gupta sir, again, once again, thank you thank so you much. Yeah. Uh, before we move uh, to the next session, I just take opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor uh, Rakesh Prasant. So, uh, Professor Rakesh Prasant is uh, the J uh, SW Chair Professor of Innovation and Public Policy and Professor of Economics at IIM Ahmedabad. His current teaching and research interests focus on firm strategy, innovation, entrepreneurial business models, public policy, and regulation. His recent research has focused on capability building process in industrial clusters, FDI and in R&D, uh, competition policy, industry academy collaboration, uh, strategic and policy aspect of intellectual property rights, uh, linkages between uh, public policy and technological change, economics of strategy and the small scale sector in India and policy issues in higher education. The sectoral focus of the research in the aforementioned areas has been pharmaceutical, IT, electronics, and auto component industries. Professor Basant was a member of Indian Prime Minister's high-level committee, also known as Sachar Committee. This committee wrote a report on the social, economic, and educational condition of uh, Muslims in India. In continuation of his work, a part of his current research focus on issues related to Muslims, especially affirmative action in higher education. Professor Basant is a recipient of Ford Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship in Economics and he spent two years at the Economic Growth Center at Yale University, USA. He also spent a term at University of Wisconsin, USA as a visiting professor. He also worked as a constant, uh, consultant to uh, several international organizations like the World Bank and the United Nations. Along with many national and international uh, publications, Professor Basant has delivered invited uh, lectures in several international and national forums like Yale, Houston, Pennsylvania, Stanford, Berkeley, and London Business School. So, sir, your profile is very inspiring to all of us, and we wish you achieve more success in future endeavors. Congratulations once again for your book, and thank you for agreeing to share your expertise with us. So, platform is yours, sir, Professor Basant. Thank you. Thank you so much for those kind words and for the opportunity to talk to you uh, about my book. Uh, let me start by saying that I don't consider myself as an expert. Um, one learns in the classroom every day and one figures out that one has a long, long way to go uh, before one can say that one understands uh, various issues well. Uh, so what I have done for today's uh, discussion is uh, prepared a short presentation, uh, which I'll take you through. Uh, hopefully, we'll be done uh, with that in about 25 uh, minutes or so. And after that, I would like uh, it to be an interactive session so that I can uh, get to know more about the kind of work you are doing. Uh, what uh, Professor Gupta mentioned about multidisciplinarity uh, and its role in innovation is something which we I'll be talking about a bit in my uh, talk as well. Uh, so we can take that issue as well as we uh, go along. So what I have done is I have uh, sort of put together some uh, basic stuff which I talk about in the book. Uh, as you can imagine, it's very difficult to summarize uh, what one is trying to say uh, in this longish book. Uh, in 20, 25 minutes, but I hope to raise some issues which uh, hopefully uh, create some uh, ideas for on which we can <clears throat> discuss. So when I started to uh, think about this book, which happened many, many years ago, uh, the intent essentially was to uh, provide 
to a general reader, not necessarily an economics person or a manager or a scientist, to a general reader who was interested in um, innovation and public policy, uh, to provide a very broad brush, large canvas perspective, not getting into the details of each issue. Uh, and in the process, uh, raise some issues which I think are important in the field of innovation and public policy. Uh, and the other purpose uh, was to emphasize the need to open the two black boxes, as I call in the book, uh, the black box of innovation, and ask, start asking questions what innovation is. Uh, as Professor Gupta also mentioned at the beginning, my focus is on technological innovation. So I, uh, in the book, I talk about how one can start opening the black box of innovation, as well as open the black box of public policy um, and <clears throat> argue that unless you open these two black boxes, it will be difficult to understand the linkages between uh, the two entities, that is innovation and public policy. The third thing is that in the process of opening these black boxes, I try and highlight to the extent possible the complexity of these linkages because as you will see uh, during the presentation, the linkages are quite complex and sort of difficult to capture uh, often empirically. Uh, and then finally, <clears throat> identify a few areas uh, which to my mind are the areas where the policymakers should focus their attention. So that was the broad idea uh, and uh, I hope as we go along and I share with you the uh, essentials of the book, uh, these things will get con conveyed to you uh, <clears throat> through my presentation. Now, before I get into the uh, details uh, of the book around the four or five themes that I mentioned in the last uh, slide, uh, what is it that I'm arguing? I mean, what the, what's the core argument uh, of the book? The first argument is that if uh, one needs to develop an appropriate policy uh, for innovation, uh, it is very critical for the policymaker to understand the nature of technological innovation and to understand what technological innovation related activities entail, what all goes into it. And the argument is that if you don't understand that well, uh, you're bound to sort of go wrong in terms of the policies that you develop. The other argument is that uh, when you start thinking in terms of policy initiatives that can affect innovation in our economy, uh, one should take a very broad view of innovation policy. Instead of focusing on uh, very narrow domains like what we do in terms of R&D tax or R&D incentives or intellectual property rights, uh, and things of that kind, uh, I'm arguing that innovation policy perspective should be that all those policy instruments uh, that affect the choice of the firm with respect to innovation and innovation related activities should be considered part of innovation policy. And such a conceptualization would require that <clears throat> all the policies that affect technology related innovations at the firm level should be seen as, a, as an element of innovation policy. But once you recognize that these uh, various policy instruments can affect innovation related decisions, the conceptualization of how policy affects innovation becomes much more complex and somewhat difficult to manage. Uh, and the difficulty of managing uh, this policy innovation linkage essentially comes from the fact that the policymaker then has to worry about if all the policy instruments that she is working with are working for the same purpose. Is it they are, are they consistent with each other? Or you are giving something with one policy instrument and taking something away from another policy instrument and the overall impact is sort of negligible. So the consistency across various innovation policy instruments becomes very critical as soon as you recognize the fact that a large number of <clears throat> policies can affect uh, innovation at the firm level. And the overarching theme uh, for a policymaker has to be 
that what do I do to create innovation capabilities in, 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 in the economy? And if one wants to give that kind of a focus to our policy making, then they will have to worry about how the policies that you are using to support innovation in the economy are affecting in competition and how they are affecting what I call contagion conditions, uh, which essentially mean how firms are able to learn from each other. Uh, in economics, we call it spillovers, which essentially means that you have developed something. How do I, how much I am able to learn from them? How, whether uh, to looking at your patent document or uh, figuring out what kind of product you're making, because innovation uh, gets <clears throat> supported by the nature of competition. If I face competition, I am incentivized to deal with that competition through, through innovation. And if I'm able to learn from others, it facilitates my innovation activity. So both competition and contagion conditions affect my innovation activities and the policymakers need to uh, worry about how uh, those conditions are being affected by the policy instruments that one is using. And I'll come to that uh, some more details later on this. Uh, the other general policy focus uh, should be that the cost of capital and infrastructure should be low. Because most of the innovation activities require a variety of infrastructure, which is including ICT and so on. And since innovation is something which you develop in the lab or in the company, then you take it to the market. If it is not taken to the market, it is just an invention. And in order to take it to the market, you require a wide variety of other investments uh, in new machinery, in marketing and distribution channels, in buying new kind of raw materials. All that requires capital. And therefore, it is not only important to have lower cost of capital for R&D that you do in the company, but also the cost of capital which is required to take your invention to the market, in other words, innovate, uh, that is equally, if not more important. So one needs to worry about what's happening to cost of capital in, in the economy and policymakers need to reduce cost of capital as well as infrastructure. The third argument uh, for policy focus is that we need to refocus our or restructure our higher education system, and I'll talk about that uh, later. And finally, <clears throat> I talk about a few uh, new policy initiatives that are, to my mind, critical uh, for uh, creating an entrepreneurial ecosystem because not a lot of new innovations are coming through startups uh, in these, these days. And if we don't have a proper ecosystem, we will lose out on that. And <clears throat> finally, I argue uh, that the policymakers should uh, for certain areas and for certain uh, focus areas, develop mission-driven approaches uh, to make our e economy uh, or our country uh, competitive in specific sectors and technologies. And that might require, as I'll argue later, some kind of public policy uh, uh, kind of models, pu uh, pu public-private partnership kind of model, something which your center uh, is focusing on. Okay, so going back to uh, this point that the policymaker needs to understand the nature of innovation and innovation activities before uh, he or she can start thinking about uh, policy instruments which will be useful for innovation in the economy. Now, all of us know that uh, <clears throat> for innovation in, an, in a company, uh, you can either develop uh, your own product or process doing your own R&D you can buy technology from outside and use it to develop a new process or a product. Uh, it can be in the form of a license uh, from uh, getting from outside uh, the firm, or it can also be in the form of a new machine, which helps you develop a new product or produce a new product. Uh, you can also innovate by imitating others, uh, which I call the uh, contagion effect or the spillover effect. So you, observe others, understand, open up others' technologies, invent around and learn from them. And so firms typically com combine all these three 
uh, which in a crude sense, we can say make by copy uh, activities. And there's nothing wrong in copying because one over the historically, all economies, all firms in different countries have learned from each other through uh, <clears throat> imitation of some kind or the other. So we need to understand that for innovation, all these three activities are critical. And the, to say that I can only support R&D and I don't want to worry about what's happening to uh, buying of technology or what's happening to learning possibilities, then the policy may not be <clears throat> as appropriate. Now, there is a very large survey of about 9,000 firms which was done by the World Bank um, some years ago. And they found that about 45% um, firms in the sample uh, had developed new product innovations. About 48% uh, of them had developed new process innovations. So they reported 45% reported product innovations, 48% reported product uh, process innovations. But interestingly, only 33% firms were actually doing R&D, which means that <clears throat> for many firms, uh, the innovation was coming from somewhere else and not necessarily from their own uh, R&D activity. So where were these product and process innovations coming from? And so one way of looking at it is, uh, as was pointed out a little while ago, that many of these product and process innovations might be incremental and only new to the local market, which does not require significant amount of R&D activity. Uh, but the other interesting fact that come, came out of this survey was that only 14% 14 for, 14 firms said that the innovation ideas originated within the firm. Right? They said that most innovation ideas came from outside the firm, from customers, suppliers, competitors, and, and so on. And therefore, the idea of spillovers or contagion or learning from others, whether they are suppliers, customers, or competitors, is something which is, which is very critical for innovation, and the policymakers need to recognize that. And the other source uh, was technology purchased from outside, whether in the form of a new machine, as I mentioned earlier, or in the form of, uh, of a license uh, and so on. Now, what is the policy relevance of this evidence? I mean, uh, the fact that a large variety of sources uh, are used by firms, and therefore the <clears throat> policymaker need to, needs to understand that these several sources of ideas uh, for innovation are not substitutes of each other. They complement each other, they build on each other. And therefore the firm has to have avenues for uh, doing all the three activities. And if you try and curtail uh, one kind of uh, source of knowledge uh, significantly, uh, then you may find yourself in a situation where the firm is not able to be as innovative uh, as possible. So policy should not curtail specific sources. Otherwise, it, it may have a negative uh, impact on innovation. And I'll come back to this a little later when I talk about intellectual property rights. Uh, if the IP regime, for example, is creating a situation where it is virtually impossible to invent around and the IP regime is so stringent that firms can't learn from others and build on it, then the spillover possibility or the imitation possibility goes down dramatically and firms lose an important source of innovation. And that may not be uh, the right thing to do, uh, at least in our kind of context, uh, because as I said, uh, imitation buying and making are all, all complementary kind of sources. And <clears throat> the other possibility could be that policymakers may put significant restrictions on technology flows from outside. I mean, so if I say uh, that, <clears throat> I will not allow imports to happen because I want to do everything inside my country. Uh, you are essentially saying that sources of knowledge from outside, which can come in the form of new machines or new raw materials uh, and so on, those sources are blocked for you. And you are trying to invent everything on your own. And those kind of restrictions can be counterproductive. Uh, in, the, in the short run, we might feel that we are 
increasing our economic activities within the country and some r and is happening. But in the long run, virtually all economies have shown that if you have a closed economy and you are not allowing outside uh, competition and outside knowledge sources to come in, uh, you are not likely to be very innovative, right? So, so understanding of how innovation happens, what kind of innovations happen, is very important for policymakers to understand that both competition, which pushes people to innovate, and contagion or spillover possibilities where firms are able to learn from each other are very critical for innovation in a particular economy. And one should not thwart or put significant constraints in one area uh, because they are all kind of complementary with each other. So that was one part where I initially said that it's important for policy makers to understand the nature of innovation uh, to make appropriate policies. The other point that I made initially was that uh, one needs to worry about consistency across innovation policy kind of instruments. Right? Now, how do policies affect innovation? Right? So virtually, I mean, we don't have the time. If there's a question, we can take that up later on. Virtually all policies that one can think of, whether it is trade policy or industrial policy or small scale policy or uh, entrepreneurship related policies or R&D policy or credit policy, whatever you may want to uh, take, uh, those policies have some effect um, on the demand and supply of knowledge. Uh, they affect the nature of competition and they affect the kind of learning opportunities that firms have. And I can map virtually all, all these um, uh, policies uh, onto these demand supply uh, linkages as well as competition and contagion conditions linkages. So let me give take two examples to uh, uh, convince you of that. So suppose you take a policy of government procurement. I mean, some days ago, uh, government of India announced a very interesting policy that they will buy <clears throat> aircraft from Airbus Spain, uh, uh, some, I don't remember the number, 400 odd aircrafts, uh, they will come, 16 of them would come uh, all assembled, uh, but the remaining 40%, 40 would be assembled by the Tatas. So effectively, it's a policy which, uh, <clears throat> it's a procurement policy, to, so to say, for defense purposes. But after the technology comes in, uh, the technology is shared with uh, a private entity, uh, which is then implementing it uh, to make uh, those planes inside the country. So procurement facilitated the transfer of technology. Right? And that technology transfer is happening to a private entity. So it's a public procurement affecting transfer of technology by a multinational company to a local domestic private company. And that company then starts to build on that technology and making that aircraft. And then once they start to make that aircraft uh, <clears throat> in the country, they will build linkages with other vendors within the country, and then they will transfer knowledge. And uh, the overall capability of technology uh, would uh, go up. So in this case, procurement policy increased the supply of knowledge, right? And created conditions where firms can learn from this knowledge, in this case, private knowledge. Similarly, think in terms of a FDI policy. Right? So you say that I will uh, <clears throat> improve the conditions under which FDI can come in. I'm liberalizing FDI policy. Right? So what does that do? FDI policy gets liberalized. Multinational companies start to come in and start competing with uh, the domestic firms. Those firms will okay say that, OK, I need to deal with it. Our innovation is one way of dealing with it. So one starts to move it. So that's, FDI flows enhance competition, and that in turn uh, affect firms behavior vis-a-vis -vis innovation. And innovation may be one of the responses uh, uh, to take care of the FDI or multinational competition. But multinationals, when they come in, they also bring new technologies. They bring in new knowledge. They bring in um, <clears throat> new kinds of products and so on, which creates opportunities for the domestic firms to learn from. And this learning can happen by opening the product that they are selling, sort of inventing around, 
it can also it can also come from the linkages that multinationals build with the local vendors because knowledge gets uh, transmitted to them right so once again both competition and contagion conditions uh, are getting affected the same i can go on i mean trade policy can be looked at the same uh, <clears throat> way so all these policies which are listed here can potentially be seen as policies which either affect demand and supply of knowledge or affect the competition and contagion conditions uh, which the firms uh, kind of face right uh, <clears throat> the consistency of policy instruments which affect innovation through changing the demand and supply of knowledge or changing the competition and contagion conditions uh, are difficult to analyze because they affect the choices of firms simultaneously right so i if i am a firm i uh, i have i my competitor has developed a new kind of fountain pen and i have to react to that through innovation so what do i do i do i do my own r and d and develop a new pen or i license it from outside uh, and <clears throat> start making that pen or i buy the machinery that is being used by some competitors outside the country and buy that machinery and start building on that machine so one so if i am buying machinery from outside trade policy will affect me if i am buying in licensing through license te li technology license thing would affect me if i have to build on my own then r and d policy will affect me right now when i am making a choice i'll ask this question that these policies are in place technology licensing policies are like this r and d policies are like this uh, trade policies are like this which is the best option uh that i have given these kinds of policies right now if you your idea is to encourage r and d in that particular area suppose fountain pen is a important technology area which is not but just for the sake of argument then <clears throat> if the trade policy and licensing policies are taking you in a completely different direction and the firm finds that those two are much better options then there is no consistency in the purpose of different policy methods right and you have to have uh, some kind of a, a coherence in the issue right now <clears throat> so how does one figure out whether policies are consistent or not and whether they are effective or not it is difficult i mean i have reviewed a lot of studies in my book on uh, various countries and how different policies affect innovation and so on so there are there are a lot of complexities there are a lot of variations and so on but a few things come out strongly across countries uh, and across industry one thing that comes across very strongly across studies is that um, any innovation policy related instrument would be useful if the firms in the country have good innovation capability and if not good capability to absorb what is being brought in now if you bring in something and i can't understand what technology is coming i can't absorb it i can't build on it and so on any kind of policy instrument which enhances supply of knowledge uh, or even possibility of contagion or imitation will go for a toss because i can't learn i mean it's a the technology gap is so large that i can't figure out what is happening uh, in in that area and i can't learn the other general condition that has been found is that firms are operating in an open economy and face competition so most of the studies have shown that if in the medium and long run policy makers do whatever they want in terms of innovation policy instruments if they create an economy which is closed which is not open to the outside world uh, through trade competition or otherwise or they don't face competition internally in the long run innovation efforts are going to be not as uh, as as good uh in the case of india a uh, few studies have looked at the what we call in economics the total product factor productivity growth which is a measure of technological change and if you look at the total factor productivity growth in our economy from say roughly uh, 1980 to 2017 2018 one finds that the tfp growth or the technological growth was the highest in those phases where our economy was 
having more competition, contestability was high, the economy was open, that trade barriers were limited. And <clears throat> in this period, R&D expenditures grew and firms also purchased more knowledge technology from our side. So you had a combination of an open economy, a competent, contestable competent, competition driven economy, and where firms were doing more R&D and buying technology from our side. So even the Indian context shows that it is important to have a situation where uh, firms operate in an open economy and face competition. Now, <clears throat> therefore, the policy challenge is that we need to come up with a policy package uh, which induces investments in capability building, which can be R&D, it can also be training, for example, without curtailing flows of knowledge from various sources and without curtailing competition. So you need to create incentives in such a manner where you are not telling the firm that I have cut off competition from multinationals. I have cut off competition from the other non-licensed holders. I have cut off competition from trade. And then now you have a market and build technology. If that is the notion, then it's not going to work. It's, it's, it's not going to give us the kind of a... So you have to create an environment where you create incentives for developing capabilities, but at the same time, uh, ask them, ask the firms to continue to compete uh, with external and internal entities and also allow them to learn from others. So an example of this could be that suppose you have you are giving R&D subsidy, which means that firms uh, can do more R&D because the R&D costs are lower because it's being subsidized. Uh, <clears throat> but at the same time, you have high cost of capital. Right? So you have subsidized R&D, R&D gets done probably, and some innovation or invention comes up, but the money that is required to take that invention to the market, uh, you go to the bank and the cost of capital is very high. So if I have developed an innovation, but I can't, I don't have the money to take it to the market, uh, then innovation is not likely uh, to happen. At the same time, you have high cost of capital, but competition is, uh, has been reduced, you say, okay, the cost of capital is high, but you are not facing as much competition, so you should be able to work. Uh, and economy is also closed, the so people are not competing with you from outside. Uh, and that kind of a situation has not worked in other economies. So one have to uh, create a system where incentives to create <clears throat> uh, uh, investments in capability building will have to be combined with uh, high competition and an open economy. And in this context, I i mean, if there are questions, I can talk about it later on. We are not very sure what form the current uh, policy package of art and the Bharat will take. It's still evolving and it's not very sure what kind of uh, <clears throat> policy package will eventually evolve. But if it does restrict trade and hampers competition in saying that, uh, it's, it's made only made in India, we are in for trouble. Uh, and we are may not be in for trouble in the short run, but we are certainly in for trouble in the long run. Because historically, economies which have tried to do this have failed miserably. <clears throat> then I come to uh, another part of uh, the book, which is uh, looking at the role of higher education and the innovation ecosystem. And uh, in your case, you're working uh, the knowledge cluster. And this part is, to my mind, quite relevant for the kind of work uh, you are doing. Now, all of us know that higher education institutions build innovation and production capabilities through a variety of uh, mechanisms, right? Uh, we train students. Uh, and these skills are used uh, by them to find jobs. So that's a standard labor market link. I mean, you train and people work in different companies and that knowledge gets used in these companies. So that's the uh, contribution to production capabilities. Uh, higher education institutions also do research uh, and outputs of those research can be taken to the market and then directly contribute uh, to innovation. Uh, they can be 
engaging in a variety of university industry linkages through projects and consulting assignments and so on, creating production and innovation capabilities in, this, in the companies or taking part of the university knowledge for the purpose of the company's activities related to innovation. Now, I have argued in the book that higher education institutions probably are the weakest link in India's national innovation system. Uh, and why is that? Uh, the kind of skills and education that we are able to provide is still is not adequate for the current needs and certainly not for the future needs of our economy. So those gaps are still uh, quite high and we need to worry about what kind of skill and education we should be imparting. The research intensity of higher education institutions is quite low and the university industry linkages are virtually kind of non-existent. So if research is not happening in higher education institutions, what can you take here to the market in the form of, of, of uh, uh, innovation and so on? Okay. Now, in this context, one can ask this question, would the new education policy help? Okay. Once again, it's too early to uh, <clears throat> say anything, but we are we have to wait for these details to come out and figure out what how the policy would take shape. Uh, the ideas which are mentioned in the policy are uh, not very clear. Uh, they use the right kind of words like holistic and multidisciplinary. It was mentioned in the beginning and I said it's a very important part uh, which is critical for innovation in higher education institutions. Uh, but they have not, the policy does not define what it means. I mean, multidisciplinary uh, term comes up in, I don't know, 60 odd places in the policy, but nowhere it's very clear what, what is it that they have in mind, right? Um, to my mind, the way the policy would evolve and its impact would very significantly uh, get affected by how autonomous the higher education institutions are and how adequate uh, the resource situation is. Right? So if you are not providing autonomy to higher education institutions uh, to decide what kind of courses they can do, what kind of research they, they can do, and also provide adequate resources, uh, no new education policy can help. I mean, if you have very stringent, narrowly focused kind of ideas about how education should be done, a uh, thousand flowers are not going to bloom. So we will have to be flexible uh, about <clears throat> what universities can do and provide them significant autonomy. The other thing which one needs to do is uh, correct a major distortion uh, that has plagued our uh, higher education system is by separation of research and teaching. Uh, you are scientists, you know that uh, CSIR labs were created um, focusing only on research, hardly any teaching, uh, maybe a little bit of PhD uh, students. Uh, and in the social sciences domain where I come from, Indian Council of Social Science Research was created, a large number of uh, social science research centers came up in different parts of the uh, country. And as a result from universities, the research intensive people moved to these locations because there were better resources available, probably they didn't want to teach as much or for whatever reason. I mean, there was the separation of research and teaching unlike in the West where they coexist, right? And separation of research and teaching not only uh, reduces the quality of teaching, but it also reduces the possibility of innovation because the students uh, understand what kind of research is doing and they, they may not be interested in research, but they may get ideas about how that research can be taken to the <clears throat> uh, uh, market, right? So in the new ed education policy, the, they talked about teaching universities and research universities. Uh, it's not very clear to me, at least, what is it that they have in mind because universities have to have both teaching and research. Uh, and, and that is very critical uh, for innovation because otherwise, new knowledge that is created through research is will not uh, going to happen. Now, there is a another new policy instrument that is being talked about. Uh, it started many years ago, but it was in cold storage. Uh, it happened, um, I think, way back in 2009, 10. 
but it has been taken out of the cold storage now and people are talking about uh, a new kind of act uh, which is similar to the Bedol Act which was implemented in the US in the 1980s uh, which essentially says that uh, whatever technology or innovation that you develop using the public uh, research funds is university's intellectual property and they can commercialize it and make money out of it. Right? And the jury is still out whether the Bedol Act helped the research activity or uh, innovation activity in uh, universities in the US. But the point is that the situation in India is so, so different from the economies in the West uh, that this act is, I mean, completely misplaced. It is, I mean, putting the cart before the horse kind of a situation because research in universities are still not research intensive. They are unlike the US and elsewhere, they are not competing for resources uh, from large endowments and so on for their research. So there is no competition, there is no research. What will they patent? I mean, they, they, so one has to build that research come teaching culture, create a situation where um, university is not really for the so-called ranking that goes on, compete with each other in a substantive manner to raise resources for research, only then an IP related act uh, may uh, <clears throat> help us in creating a higher education system which is research intensive and which will create a significant impetus for our innovation uh, system. The other thing which uh, a lot of policy makers have been talking about and we have done tremendous amount of policy activity uh, in this space and that relates to uh, startups, right? So DST has supported incubators all over the country. Uh, they run accelerators uh, and so on so that you can support the <clears throat> uh, creation of innovation driven kind of startups. And all of you must be knowing that many accelerators and incubators have sprung up in India uh, and most of them are set up with government support, particularly uh, DST, and they're located in higher education institutions. Now, the question is, setting up of such entities useful to foster innovation driven startups, right? Uh, I have been part of the Center for Innovation, Incubation, and Entrepreneurship at our institute, which probably is one of the best incubators in the country. We have faced difficulties, although, I mean, we are probably one of the best, but there are, uh, <clears throat> difficulties that which most incubators and accelerators face. The government gives them initial grant to set up incubators or accelerators, right? But they are not financially viable. They are so subscale, uh, they don't have the right kind of managers and staff to develop uh, new technologies and take them to the market. Uh, and beyond a point, the grant stops and then they are not financially viable while the rest of the departments in the university uh, worry, what is this entity doing? I mean, so they are neither financially viable nor organizationally sustainable because they are not integrated with the research and other activities of, of the institution, right? And so therefore, one has to have a business model where uh, incubators earn income, not only from government grants, but other sources as well. And because they are subscale, uh, money that might come in through equity and from other fees and so on, which the startups might provide, it is so small that you can't run a good accelerator or incubator, particularly when you want to have good people to manage the incubator. And good people are not inexpensive. They come in, they'll come in only when they find reasonable uh, remuneration and reasonable amount of flexibility and autonomy. Now, and they also operate in a situation where the entrepreneurial ecosystem is so not so viable. Things have improved dramatically in the last 10 years or so, but still we lack a very, very vibrant uh, innovation ecos uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem as compared to other economies. And since higher education institutions are not doing any research, uh, it's the accelerators and incubators can't take uh, their research to the market, barring a few IITs and Institute of Science and so on, but it's not a large scale. Uh, kind of a <clears throat> now in this context, what I uh, argue, and this might be relevant 
for your knowledge cluster as well. Uh, I argue that instead of creating clusters which are institution specific, that I'm giving an incubator to IIM Ahmedabad or IIT Bombay or to uh, <clears throat> other an institution, it should be cluster based, right? And that has several uh, advantages if the cluster has multiple higher education institutions which bring in different disciplinary specializations. And through this cluster-based incubation and acceleration activity, you create a platform for them to uh, collaborate and develop new innovations and uh, innovation-driven kind of uh, startups. So it brings in multidisciplinarity, which is very critical for innovation, as was pointed out earlier. Uh, <clears throat> and it helps us simulate an environment of a large university that exists in other uh, developed economies like the US, and we don't have it. I mean, in, there are, there is no good university in India where I can do a course on music and physics uh, and uh, do a course on some topic of management and economics. It's, it's virtually impossible to do uh, those kinds of courses. I typically will not meet a person in design when I go to a coffee place, right, and on the campus. I will not meet engineer and a designer and, and a management student together. So all those possibilities, which are possible in a cluster which has multiple institutions, which may be specialized on their own, but they bring in their own uh, uh, capabilities and create a multidisciplinary uh, environment till we are able to create large universities which encompass uh, multiple disciplines. That is one way of <clears throat> taking care of it because innovation and entrepreneurship are essentially multidisciplinary activities. And these cluster-based uh, incubation uh, might provide you the space uh, to foster an ecosystem for innovation. And at the same time, it helps you reap economies of scale. I mean, subscale incubators in all uh, engineering colleges across the country uh, are struggling to survive. Here you have uh, situation where you can have multiple types of uh, enterprises from <clears throat> a designer cloth, uh, clothes enterprise to a high tech uh, AI based enterprise, and they, they can all coexist in the economy of scale and scope. Um, <clears throat> and finally, if you have a cluster based incubation, this thing activity is large enough, uh, they can also support a venture fund. I mean, uh, in our case, uh, in, in IMA, uh, we have grown quite rapidly and we've been able to attract and retain very good talent because uh, we have been able to create uh, a couple of venture funds, which we invest in our incubating companies and the management fees of that venture fund is used by us to pay salaries. And they <clears throat> so you have economies of scale and you on top of that, then you're able to create uh, kind of a venture fund arm which helps you support your companies in the second and third round of, of um, funding. At the same time, you are able to create a management team which will run the incubator well and take it uh, to a, a higher level. And the companies will come to you because they see value uh, in being part of this incubation center. Subscale incubation centers run by not so <clears throat> uh, skilled uh, managers uh, are difficult to <clears throat> retake, I mean, uh, su survive in this, right? And <clears throat> finally, the thing which the book talks about um, in the book that it talks about is the importance of uh, financing uh, innovation. Uh, innovation is a major, uh, financing innovation is a major concern in all economies, particularly in developing nations where the uh, you talked about the stock markets and physics and so on, because the uh, <clears throat> markets are not as mature and they are not able to uh, figure out the value of an invention or a company which is innovative and so on. So as I mentioned earlier, innovation involves investing in new product processes uh, and the complementary assets that are required to take the new product to the market. All the complementary assets may be include manufacturing, marketing, distribution, brand building, uh, creating um, 
a sales force and so on all that requires money right so money is not only required to develop the product or process but also to take it to the market and that requires money and if raising that money is expensive why will firm invest in creating a new product because they know that the cost of taking the product to the market is so high and cost of capital is very high so finance is needed at all stages uh, of the uh, innovation product life cycle right from initial r and d to uh, taking it to the market and then spreading it to larger economy and larger market uh, so if you have high cost of profit capital it will deter a uh, kind of innovation and r and d subsidy does not compensate for high cost of capital and infrastructure in india uh, because only one part of your innovation activity is subsidized while the other parts of innovation which require <clears throat> use i mean if cost of power is very high or the road uh, system is so bad that the, it takes a lot of time and lots of cost to bring your uh, products to different parts of the country uh, or if telecom uh, infrastructure is costly all that adds to your cost right so the uh, in the economics what we say is that all those products and services which are non tradable that is which you can't import from outside if those costs are high any innovation activity would suffer because it's it's a it's a fixed cost for the innovator right you will have to include those costs so just like there are innovation related financing problems for all firms uh the gaps are also quite significant for startups although a lot of seed funds have been created by the government venture capital companies have started to uh, move in the direction where they are supporting uh, innovation driven startups but we still have a uh, long way to go to fill these gaps many firms face innovation driven firms i mean the firms which are consumer focused they are i mean they are not really innovation product driven firms but they are satisfying a market need money is available but if it is uh, something which requires a long gestation period it is very technology driven ai driven and so on venture capital is still uh, a problem now <clears throat> to solve this problem uh, government of india announced uh, a fund of funds uh, of 10000 crores uh, some years ago which was being implemented by cp and if you look at the numbers hardly anything has been disbursed uh, from that and which means that the financing related problems for startups which are driven by innovation or technology uh, are still is still a major kind of a problem now <clears throat> based on the experience that we have had uh, of running a public private uh, partnership model uh, of uh, support for supporting clean energy driven startups the book argues that the fund of funds can have a similar model and so what is the model there the model is actually fairly simple and if you people have more questions we can come back to it in the q and a session the government of india ministry of new and renewable energy gave us a grant of 24 crores and they said that you use this grant to seed uh, a venture fund to support <clears throat> clean energy startups startups which use new technologies uh, in the speed solar or biomass or wind and so on uh, but the condition is that you'll have to raise uh, another 24 crores from the private entities right so the fund was to be uh, of 48 crores uh, and we did much better than that we raised many more rupees and so our fund became a 110 crore fund so 24 crore given by the government of india was leveraged to raise more money and the fund became 110 crore fund which we invested in the uh, clean energy startups which were technology driven now in the investment of of uh, that money uh, the model was that neither the government of india nor the private entities like godrej and sibbi and all those people who had uh, contributed money to this fund were involved in these investment decisions investment decisions by were made by a professional set of people who understood the investment uh, related processes and there was no interference from the public or the private entities who contributed to the fund in the decision making process of 
who to fund and how much to fund, right? And the understanding was that if the fund makes money, the first profit would go to the private entities, and then the money will flow to the public. Uh, and that's the government, which was essentially to come back to us, which will reinvest in our fund. If there's a loss, government will take the first loss, and later on, the private sector. So there was a buffer for the private entities to invest because they knew that <clears throat> it's a very risky venture. It's a long gestation period project, uh, high technological uncertainty. Um, so I'm arguing that this kind of a model where investment decisions are autonomous, not interfered by the government or the private sector. Uh, and one can say that I'm interested in this kind of technology and I focus on these like in the clean energy we did. And so this kind of a PPV model reduces the uncertainties uh, <clears throat> that are faced <coughs> by the investors and the risks and the transaction costs faced by the private players sort of come down because all the investments are being done by uh, professionals and so on. And then they have more incentive to, uh, and it also minimizes the probability of distortions that the government can create by interfering in uh, you invest in this particular entity because of XYZ reason. So there was no distortion created. So we were able to take care of government failure as well as the failure that might come in where private players want to push their own projects, which uh, should not. Uh... Now, the same model, to my mind, can be utilized uh, to support mission driven endeavors, right? Suppose I say that um, uh, I want to do something in the AI domain, or I want to do something in the blockchain domain, or some technology or some area, I want to do something in with respect to clean water, right? Um, and create startups and other technologies for the, something like what Sematech did a long time ago when the US was facing competition uh, from Japan for chips. Um, so you create a fund, which is public private kind of a fund, but the decisions about what technologies to support and how to support uh, should be left to people who understand it rather than uh, decided by the whims and fancies of uh, who's giving you the uh, money. So this kind of a model can give you opportunities to combine developmental money, which comes from uh, the government, uh, strategic money, which comes from certain companies who might say, okay, if this startup in this AI domain does very well, I can acquire it and extend my, uh, my uh, objectives. Uh, it can also come from commercial capital. There is a uh, venture capital fund who say, okay, I want to deploy my resources to a particular startup. Let this be one of the, right? So you are able to provide a platform for development money, which has long gestation period. They're not looking for very high returns. Uh, commercial capital, which may be looking for strategic returns and so on. Uh, so it provides you with those kinds of options to support um, <clears throat> technology development and innovation in areas where uh, we're either facing a tremendous social problem or uh, an area of technology or sector where we want to strategically move into. Right? So that can potentially be uh, a mechanism for us to enter in that kind of a domain. Uh, I'll stop here. I've taken more time than I anticipated. Uh, but thank you for uh, listening. Uh, <clears throat> and <clears throat> we'll take the question. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Professor Basan, to walk us through innovation black box and public policy black box and how we have to open them up, interlink with each other. Thanks for giving us food for thought on how policy should work and how they should address innovation activities and their impact. We have a number of questions in our chat box. Uh, before moving to the questions posted in the chat box, if anyone has any pertinent comment or questions, uh, they can raise their hand, we can take them right away. And then I'll uh, move to our chat box. <laughs> Professor Basan, we have a number of questions in our chat box. You can also go through them. And we have multiple participants who have uh, 
given two or three questions like i have posted around four to five questions i can take my question to the last i'll request the participants uh, to come and speak and yeah yeah professor basu yeah it will be better yeah, if the so person answer of my reading through the yeah so i'll just call the person and uh, as they have posted around sure. two to three questions they can take up the most pertinent questions so i'll just uh, sure. start from the below uh, samya samya can you just come in and uh, ask your question and, uh, ask your question yes please so, sir uh, thank you so much sir for your uh, nice lecture sir it really helps a lot to all of us uh, all the policy research fellows so my question is uh and an analysis of data i have uh, uh from that side that uh, top 100 universities and engineering institution shows that the research grant per university is about 20 crores per year and uh, about uh, 5 lakh per faculty in the top universities of okay. india so this is like 1/6 of uh, the uh, budget of r&d support per faculty in the lowest tier research in us so how can we improve this insufficient improvement means insufficient investment improvement so my question is that <coughs> in terms of policy perspective or in terms of so that's a that's a, yeah, that's a very good very question uh, uh, bulk, of bulk of the research, research funds, funds there is an echo i don't know so bulk of the research funds that the university get are from the government right and uh, if uh, for example a um, we decide that we will leverage government funds to raise higher more resources for a particular area uh, where uh, the university may be having the right kind of capabilities or the private sector or the government wants some more work one one can again leverage a uh, public private kind of situation now i think i have asked this question to a few uh industry people as well because i being in a school of management i get to meet a large number of uh industry people and my complaint to them is that they fund they give so much money to foreign universities uh for research and other things they don't give money to us right and they they don't support research here now so once while they agree that that's true they all the big wigs like they are billas or tatas or ambanis uh, they all giving money to us universities rather than giving them to indian universities their argument is that they have better capabilities uh than what we have and therefore their money goes a long way there so it's a kind of a chicken and egg problem and i i tell them that unless you support those capabilities will not get built uh the only way i can think Uh, something can happen is that as research capabilities build and one is able to leverage private sector funds with public sector funds to create something useful and new uh we will get into a uh, virtuous cycle uh but that would require the government of india to be open just like they were in the case of clean energy fund and say if it fails it fails Just leverage our money to raise more resources for a larger research project, which is more ambitious. Uh, I doubt that the government will ever have the resources to uh, support a uh, huge amount of research in universities. The other possibility is, I mean, for example, Tata's have got this. Uh, they have to make these planes, which the technology comes from uh, Airbus, Spain. uh if some part of that technology absorption or indigenization is done with the help of universities i mean sir new material comes in or something else happens in the form of design and so on once again that gets supported that research gets supported so we'll have to strategically keep looking for these potential linkages where we can leverage uh, government money uh, or government procurement or government policies uh, for example we use the money which was there in the ministry of new and renewable energy for their solar mission and we said you are not using it is lying idle why don't you give it to us and, and so it happened i mean i'm not saying it's easy it was uh, so i i don't know whether i've answered your question but that's the direction which can potentially be taken
नो सर थैंक यू सो मच सर फॉर योर सर एज अ विद योर परमिशन कैन आई आस्क वन मोर क्वेश्चन प्लीज या सर मींस दिस क्वेश्चन इज द डिस्कनेक्ट बिटवीन द लोकल इकोनॉमी एंड सोसाइटी देयर इज अ मच डिस्कनेक्ट बिटवीन हायर एजुकेशन हायर एजुकेशन इंस्टीट्यूशन एंड एजुकेशन व्हिच इज लार्जली डिस्कनेक्टेड विद लोकल इकोनॉमी एंड सोसाइटी so right. that make our education less directly relevant to social purpose so uh, what are your views in uh, on this trust area uh, what what do you think sir <coughs> um <laughs> that's, that's a difficult that's a societal, societal problem, problem, problem right? Right? I mean, um, as middle um, class people we are disconnected with uh, the society around us right i mean it's a it's it's a, something which is more uh, generic uh, kind of an aberration uh, but once again there are certain universities uh, who are trying to uh, do projects uh, with the local uh, entities i mean for example uh, we have tried to work with the amdavad municipal corporation to say okay what are the problems that you have which we can help you solve and that can be done through student projects uh, and so on uh, we have done projects around water we have done projects around sanitation and, and so on which provide some exposure to the students to the problems around of course we are part of an elite system right so um, uh, so that is possibly one way of connecting to the um, uh, local uh, context and environment uh it can only be through courses and projects uh if it it, it has a significant uh, field work component uh that gives you exposure to the environment in which you are operating uh, uh so uh, for example uh, we do a course uh called new technology applications design and business models right so which i teach here and every year we take a a particular domain so this year we took the domain of civic tech so how technology can be used to solve uh, civic related problems right um, so uh, we shared with them what's happening in this space and then students come up with new applications and then create an application kind of a crude design of that application and figure out how to take it to the market whether they are able to come up with a solution which is <clears throat> very great is not so material what is important is that they engage with the problem i mean they try and figure out what how it can be solved and start thinking about uh, what are the various options that are available which gives them once again i mean ultimately as a teacher i mean i have figured after so many years of teaching that you can only expose them to certain ideas and certain contexts uh, the rest i mean there are so many other other factors that come into play right so Once again, I mean, I don't know. These are generic kind of ideas. Thank you so much, sir. It helps a lot. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Basant. I understand that time is a limiting factor for us, and we have number of questions. Uh, I'm okay. The... I, I can go for another half an hour. I have a meeting at right. five, so it's. Uh... Okay, so that that would be really helpful. So I'll first uh, like pass the floor to an outsider who have joined our webinar. Rest of our team members are here, so we can continue with the discussion. So I'll uh, pass on the floor to Sandeep Singh. Hi, uh, Dr. Sandeep, over to you for your question. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, a very nice talk, sir. And in fact, it was very relevant to the overall ecosystem in the country. my only point is that uh, what we have fe- felt dealing with the industry especially we as csr lab uh, mostly deal with smes more these days so what we have felt that uh, learning intent is a major issue with the indian industry because uh, what we feel is that they have a peculiar uh, trading mindset they don't want to learn from you and in fact absorptive capacity is a major block but uh, the learning intent is a, is again a major precursor to the absorptive capacity so what 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 are your comments on this particular thing and secondly sir i just wanted to apprise you that uh, csr has recently started an academy of itself called academy of scientific and innovative research it's again a hni institution established by an act of parliament and now we are working 
in that reverse direction from where we started uh, disassociating ourselves from education we are now um, uh, moving in that direction to to somehow uh, fill the gap which you highlighted today thank you sir so <clears throat> Uh, so my answer to your question about learning intent and uh, absorptive capacity, uh, I, I don't do much consulting, but I have uh, interacted with uh, a large number of SMEs uh, through training programs. I mean, I do something around innovation and so on. So you're right that many of them are looking for uh, rewards which are quick. Uh, they are not patient, uh, so some innovation will happen and I'll be able to earn profit. So they, some innovation I'll do and change my shop floor or my machinery and so on. Uh, because the nature of competition that they face is such that they need to do something dramatic and quick uh, in order to face that competition. And the other thing which uh, they tell me is, uh, once you gain their confidence, is that they say that our experience with interacting with educational institutions has not been particularly great, right? They, we have not found very good solutions. They sit in their armchair and they don't really know the problem and they don't give us a solution which is implementable, right? So they come with that kind of a mindset and if you have an interesting solution to their problem, there are barriers, there are there are uh, mental barriers to, to say, to accept that. So it, and, and so their argument is that Research institutions are not equipped to solve our problems. They are at a very high level of abstraction. They don't understand our problem. Your problem is that they don't understand what you're trying to say, and they don't uh, invest in whatever suggestions that they're making. Uh, once again, my only hope is that if more and more of this happens, and there are situations where there are quick, good wins, uh, then people will start looking at <clears throat> uh these kinds of interactions more positively i mean it's similar to our large scale companies going to uh harvard's of the world and stanford's of the world for their technology solutions and not not coming to iits or uh, other engineering colleges because they feel rightly or wrongly that uh, these people will not have the right kind of technology solutions they don't have the capabilities which often is wrong actually but that's how it is Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, sir. You're very right. In fact, sir, uh, one more thing I would like to share with you is that recently, during the pandemic time, we worked on some UV-based technologies. And those UV-based technologies were simple technological solutions. Mm -hmm. We not only worked on that technology, we also developed guidelines for the implementation and we are also licensing with the government officials. In fact, AICT has uh, recently uh, floated a paper on this particular aspect. So in that, we right now have around 40 partners, all SMEs, and we wish that in a year's time uh, that that will have sufficiently mm -hmm. good market. So that is one thing that you told that if, if there is sufficient handholding, then things might proceed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, once again. Uh, so now we are left with the particular questions from our team. Before uh, moving to my colleagues, I'll first take inputs from Dr. Manmohan Gupta. So what is his, uh, like, after listening to a talk, what are your inputs for the same? We'd love to share, like, have them. Over to you, Professor Gupta. Uh, so you're muted. Very nice uh, uh, view of, uh, in fact, complex relationship between uh, uh, innovation and public policy. In fact, it is multi-layered and multi-dimensional. As one could see in the talk, there are so many issues which needs to be tackled. But I would just briefly comment about, make a comment about the higher education institutions. His comments are very relevant since I am concerned with the higher education institutions. I think uh, we are, there is a big problem, big issues. See, you can easily divide it into two parts. So there are elite institutions. Uh, which are at par with the best in the world uh, and then of course large number of other institutions so unfortunately when policies are made or comments are made we keep in mind the elite institutions 
but we have not to cater to them they in any case would survive because i know the capital kind of people they have having like i am am and of course uh, in sciences also we have superb institutions which are best in the world i have no doubt about that no doubt about that however the generality of institutions uh, there is a complete uh, you can say lack of uh, passion lack of uh, motivation lack of uh, dimensions di direction and i find lack of leadership also no unfortunately people say if you increase the salary if you give better facilities people will work i have a little different point of view like people talk of autonomy i, I have been working in the punjab university in fact whenever i want to do anything no vice chancellor ever stopped me no government ever stopped me if it is a positive and you can say a, a program which takes into account the finances also i have done several things have been done with across different vice chancellors so no vice chancellor wants that uh, if a good program is there it should not be implemented only thing the problem is with most of us we don't want to innovate we don't want to be passionate you know many times it said that uh, the our courses are not good let me tell you if you look up uh, the course work of uh, stanford berkeley harvard i have been uh, looking at those and of course our own courses there is not much difference between the two the difference lies in understanding and being problem solving and other aspects learning aspect deep learning aspect don't i would call it deep learning aspect so many times we said that autonomy is not there the autonomy in the western world comes with accountability and in our institution people want autonomy but no accountability and which means you no know, you can see that uh, uh, in many of the science departments all over the country we have complete autonomy a teacher is completely autonomous in the classroom but if you analyze those objectively not to the uh, you can say inputs given by the teacher themselves you find that the delivery is very low very poor whether it is course content whether it is a depth of learning whether it is innovation whether motivating students similarly about research also research has to be through passion and you has to excel you have to compete with the best in the world as you mentioned that until now there is a competition innovation won't come in. and unfortunately in fact i am working on a paper or document how do we really tackle this very very deep and complex problem and uh, in touch with the ugc maybe if they accept it i am sure that in 5 years things can change completely so with these brief remarks i would say that uh, the book is very relevant it has really touched i am sure that if uh, people from Uh, across uh, all disciplines not only management but i think uh, people from all aspects including sciences in fact my interaction with in the crick has really sharpened my own views about uh, science also no when i pick up problem i am very conscious that output has to be there as is in the case of uh, uh, economic policies and uh, management issues uh, particularly commercial world i would business world as it is called so you have to be business like in your approach everywhere and has really helped in shaping my attitude for the last 8 to 10 years so with these comments i would really thank the speaker for his very elaborate very deep and very thought provoking talk and of course the book has to be read also i'm sure that i would also like to have a copy of the same and go through it it seems i think i hope i would be able to understand it then i look to be if i was able to convey things today and you are properly there no reason why you should not understand the book um, so your comments are well taken the only thing i would mention is that uh, <clears throat> one needs to ask this question why we don't deliver in the classroom why we don't develop new courses and, and so on and i go back to the institutional structure and autonomy in some sense because uh, when i was growing up i studied in a, a small place like jaipur and Rajasthan University. Uh, in those days, uh, the university was extremely good. Uh, several uh, departments were uh, extremely good, and very good people who moved out to Delhi and other places were there. Now, at that time, if I am teaching in Madras University and I am an assistant professor, I am not getting uh, a, a chance to become an associate professor. Um, I will go to Jaipur, right? because i am not sure when i will get promoted uh, uh, in in my own university right but now you have a system where you have a tick mark thing like you have published x articles you have completed 6 years 
प्रमोशन तो मिल ही जाने वाला है राइट बिकॉज एक साल में नहीं मिलेगा तो चार साल में मिल जाएगा राइट तो वाई डू आई मेक एफर्ट टू डू रिसर्च एंड कम्पीट नेशनली एंड ट्राई एंड गो टू सम अदर प्लेस सो दैट हैज डन टू थिंग्स वन इज दैट यू हैव इन ब्रीडिंग एंड द डाइवर्सिटी एट द अदर एंड इज गॉट रिड्यूस आई मीन इट्स अ कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ दोज टू थिंग्स विच हैज अफेक्टेड द प्योर कल्चर ड्रामेटिकली सो वन ऑफ द गुड थिंग्स अबाउट द सो कॉल एलिट इंस्टीट्यूशन इन आर प्लेस so far i mean so long it, it's a very heterogeneous group of people and we have a peer culture i mean for example in my case my teaching ratings are made public everybody knows uh whether i taught well or not according to the students i may have done a good job the students may not understand what i was doing but their ratings are public right uh which creates a peer culture of some kind that I try and do as much as I can, uh, given the constraints and so on, and and because I know that if my teaching thing is not good and if I am not publishing in good journals, I am unlikely to be promoted. So if you have an automatic promotion kind of a system and uh, a system where you are counting, is why like X kind of journal may have happened. So I mean, it's it's a very monotonous. a uh, kind of a uh, arithmetic calculation that you do for promotion anymore right i mean so but overall you're right i mean unless you have passion uh, yes. and, and so on i mean uh, so autonomy has another form right i mean uh, none of our universities can pay salaries which are above the government of india secretary level right suppose i want to attract a very good professor indian origin professor from stanford uh and say you come and spend uh, two years here and he asks the salary he'll get he will run away i mean he, it's right so you have to create that kind of autonomy yes surely yeah yeah i agree with this specific point which is very important that uh, uh, if we can attract good talent from abroad for few years it should be allowed without any questions there is no doubt about it and it transforms the culture right yeah surely so we have three or four foreign professors in our on our campus uh, they are here because they want to experience india they can get much better salaries out there with you so the probably the universities have a lot of autonomy uh, we can uh, for example in punjab so we can invite any professor for one year there is no issue about that or two years even possibility of attracting is also no you can invite but how much you can pay the question is that uh, people are not ready to make use of this facility <laughs> No, because because you don't have housing, you don't have good schools for their children to come, and you're paying them pittance, right? Anyway, let's not get into that. It's, it's, it's uh, yeah. sorry. Please, Radhika. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks, Professor, and thanks, uh, Professor Gupta, yeah. for your comments. Uh, so we are also joined by Professor Abhinandan. Uh, Professor Abhi, he's a uh, coordinator for Center for Policy Research at IIC Bangalore. I'm sure the topic that we were discussing about having foreign uh, professors and teaching in our uh, universities, IIC Bangalore is one of the fabulous examples. So, Professor Abhi, you want to pitch in for that, or we should move ahead with the questions? Uh, I think so. He would be away, so we can directly move to our next question. So we are we are having questions from our coordinator, Professor Nirmala. Uh, she would be taking her question while in her concluding remarks. So I quickly move to my next colleague, Subdeep Kaur. She has posted a number of questions. So Subdeep, if you can come on screen and just ask the pertinent question you want to ask, Professor Rakesh. You are on uh, mute. Subdeep, you are muted. Yeah, yeah, you are. Thank you, Radhika, and uh, good evening to all. Good evening, uh, Professor Gupta. I just want to ask that uh, you know, uh, government is doing a lot in FDI sectors, and the uh, government is spending foreign, uh, you know, there are foreign policies in this. But at the university, uh, when I, uh, you know, when I talk about the the funding in universities. And especially in the research product, it is very, very low. So, what are your thoughts to increase that level? 
So, I mean, the, the question is similar to the question which was asked a little while ago about the per capita of our faculty member availability of research funds. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I think the only way is for <coughs> research intensive departments to do some more fundraising on their own uh, and try and leverage government funds to raise private funds. Uh, I mean, that's the only mechanism I've seen uh, where uh, institutions are able to raise large resources because government of India, what does it do? It basically allocates a fixed amount of money across institutions. And, and um, so <clears throat> I'm told that um, the government of India is thinking in terms of creating uh, something similar to NIH and NSF, the National Science Foundation and National Health. If that happens, then uh, you have a foundation to go to for your research funds over and above what the university gives you, right? So that may be another uh, possible option if that comes through. Uh, the issue would be uh, what are the mechanisms and how difficult it is to get money from there and whether they will work the way NIH works or NSF and NIH have completely different mechanisms and so on. Uh, so that has to be seen. But till that happens, the only option I can think of is that if you think a group of faculty members think that you can deliver something on a specific kind of research, reach out to private sector. Uh, and if it's linked to some societal stuff, then even the CSR funds can be leveraged. Uh, I know of some universities that have got CSR funds to, to work around water, for example. I think so. Thank Other you. than that, I, I can't think of anything. <laughs> yep. uh, thanks, Professor Rakesh. Uh, I'll move to uh, Mamta Bhadwaj. She has also posted a number of questions. So, Mamta, over to you for your question. Yeah, uh, actually, sir, I have many questions, but I would prefer with the, the question which is of my domain. The question is there are many uh, dormant patent lines ideal at Indian Patent Office. So according to you, would it be uh, practically possible to create a dedicated agency to deal with this uh, patent? And I personally believe they, uh, that utilization and commercialization of these patents can address the technology commercialization ecosystem in India. So uh, what are your thoughts on uh, this uh, thing? I somehow missed the first part of your question. Uh, so you're saying that most of the patents are in foreign firms' names. What did you say? Nisha? No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> many patents are uh, lying ideal at its Indian patent office. Like uh, they are granted, uh, but nobody is using them for commercialization purpose. So would it be possible to create a dedicated uh, agency to deal with these patents to address the uh, technology commercialization ecosystem in India? <clears throat> yeah, so, um, so there are two things which you should keep in mind, if you look at the patent uh, portfolio worldwide, forget about India, right? take the entire world's patent stock, um, <clears throat> about 80% is never used. Right? Even in the US, which is so patent driven economy, a large number of patents are never commercialized, or they're never sold. Right? Uh, so if it happens in India, I will not be particularly surprised. I mean, the, the patterns have different strategic roles. Uh, but on top of that, um, the problem that uh, some of us, we had done an exercise about 10, 12 years ago with the help of a uh, American firm uh, uh, on CSIR patterns. Right? I mean, when Dr. Marshalkar came, he had this big push uh, patent before you publish kind of stuff, right? So a large number of patents got published, uh, or pub got <clears throat> uh, granted. Now this agency didn't uh, did an exercise of, uh, they took a sample of, I think, thousand odd patents of CSIR. And they found that although they got the patent, uh, the value of that patent was almost non-existent. So the commercial viability uh, or uh, so CSIR did not think about whether it should be patented or not. I mean, money was available. The government of India was giving money to file patents and so on. So left, right and center, just like I was saying, you are being uh, 
evaluated on how many patent applications you file. Uh, so you went ahead and filed large number of patent applications without thinking about the possibility that this may be not very valuable, right? So that may be another reason for um, uh, not many patents getting uh, uh, commercialized. But having said that, um, it is useful for some entity to look at the patents and figure out whether there is a uh, there is scope for commercialization, right? So that's another thing going back to uh, the incubation um, uh, discussion that we were having. So if you go to uh, Manchester, for example, or even to uh, Cambridge, uh, Manchester, of course, incubation center is listed on the stock exchange. Uh, so whether it's Cambridge or UCL or Stanford or whatever, uh, they will be a part of the incubation center or innovation center. They will be a product development person. And the role of this product development person is to keep going to different labs and looking at the patent applications that are being filed and figuring out whether there are commercialization possibilities. So the task of figuring out commercial viability is not left with the faculty member or anybody else. So you have somebody who understands industry, somebody who understands technology, and somebody who understands science a bit. And he or she looks at the patent portfolio and say, okay, uh, these are the ones you should renew because there is a po possibility of commercialization. These allow them to lapse because you, as you know, patents have to be renewed, right? In order to be, uh, so that is one possibility. Um, whether we can do it in a centralized fashion, I don't know. I would prefer a more decentralized system because different labs or institutions will have different specializations and understanding of the commercial viability is very technology and sector specific. Uh, so unless we have a very large team of central evaluators who are able to look at uh, electronics versus chemical versus pharmaceutical, uh, <clears throat> I would prefer a more decentralized system. And, that will also be useful because you can directly go to the lab and see what's happening and you can talk to the faculty member and so on. One should try and exploit that to the extent possible. But my gut feeling is, yeah, thank you so much, sir. Uh, but I just want to add uh, to this, your answer that there is a, a dedicated agency in South Korea, which is dealing with the dormant uh, patent. So due to this agency, the commercial eco patent commercial uh, commercialization ecosystem has uh, like increased uh, drastically in that country. So I was thinking to do a detailed study uh, on this thing, if it can be adopted uh, in India too. So that's why this was the question I wanted to uh, yeah. so take if your the, thought. If the dormancy is because the technology is unviable to begin with, then you can't really do much about it. But if the dormancy is because people don't know about it and people have not explored, then certainly, I mean, uh, and if you have, you said that you have lots of other questions, we can do it on offline. I mean, our interaction sure, does sir. not stop today, right? So it's, yeah, so there are too many questions. There is another question uh, about the Form 27, which I want to discuss with you, but we can uh, take this question later on. Sure. So over to you, Radhika. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Uh, definitely, uh, Professor, we have loads of questions. And uh, like you touch about PPP, my working domain is entirely on PPP. So I'll, my last question will come to you with your final words. How you see what are the policy instruments that should stimulate PPP, especially for innovation and research in India? Uh, what kind of uh, policy instruments you suggest? And uh, in your viewpoint, do we need a legislative and administrative backing for promoting PPP, especially for research in India? We do have for infrastructure, we have PPP policy for infrastructure projects. We have a dedicated national committee for that, but that is lacking in terms of research to carry out science, technology, and innovation. So the final words from you and how we can push this thing as PPP is one of the core area you have discussed in book, and we really look forward to that and get your further inputs on that. Over to you, Professor Rakesh. So that's, that's a kind of a million dollar question. And uh, uh, I think we should very uh, strongly look at that option. And you're very right um, in the infrastructure sector after a lot of back and forth, 
we got something right, right? I mean, the road one was finally the bureaucracy and the government and the academics all came together and created a document which was conducive for uh, PPP growth in that kind of a domain. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we will have to do a similar kind of exercise for innovation as well. Uh, what I have described in the book relates to a very narrow part of the overall system of innovation, right? We are only looking at uh, <clears throat> uh, creation of a PPP model for uh, developing a fund to support startups in a particular domain where uh, financing is not so easy, right? So we're basically looking for uh, a kind of a domain where market failures are high, gestation periods are long, you need patient capital uh, and so on. And startups, first of all, they don't go there because they think that they can't really be profitable soon. So if you want to encourage them, you have to create a, a, a pool of money which can provide patient capital. So there uh, we found that leveraging an initial government grant to raise money from other sources uh, worked really well for us. I mean, so that was 110 crore uh, fund that we started with. And subsequently, our current fund is about 600 crores. Right. So it's a so it's a uh, so once again, we learned and we are much better equipped to deal with larger fund size and so on. Uh, but <clears throat> I think that's the uh, way to go. And and the book also talks about this mission driven kind of thing. So, so it's a so if you bring together private sector, academia and the government together to solve a particular kind of a problem, uh, there's a very you may want to look at that paper. There's a paper which is very highly cited, uh, which is there in my book, referenced in that book, by a person called Mazukato, M-A-Z-U-C-C-A-T-O. Have you heard, seen that? So she is essentially uh, talking about what, what conditions need to be satisfied in order to apply a mission-driven approach to solve uh, a technology problem for a high impact uh, kind of a sector. And she has a very interesting uh, discussion on what is needed. Um, and so I personally think that if you want to do something similar in the form of public-private partnership for innovation or technology development, something similar will have to be uh, done. Uh, and to my mind, the best model I have seen is Sematech. Have you heard about the Sematech uh, experiment? Uh, Sematech was uh, an experiment where the government U.S. government created a consortium of uh, American firms uh, to deal with the competition from Japan on uh, chips. I mean, right? So they would thought that Japan is going ahead, and then in electronics mainly. And uh, once again, they pooled resources, uh, they pooled talent, and they decided, okay, this is what we want to achieve. And uh, soon enough, uh, the U.S. Uh, economy was far ahead in terms of designing of chips than uh, the other countries, right? So to my mind, that's probably the best uh, kind of model. Um, so if the NIF kind of foundation comes into being in India, or uh, if that can support a longer, it has to be a longer term project. It can't be a project which you finish in two years or something like that. It has to be a five to 10 year kind of a horizon project. And you say, okay, we are putting in X crores, go to private sector companies and say, bring your talent, R&D talent as well as money, let us uh, do something. And whatever we find, whatever we invent, it will be then common property. So everybody would benefit. I don't know whether I want, I mean, once again, this is something which I keep thinking about. We can have a conversation on that. There are people who know more about PPP than I do. We can bring those people in. Thank you, Professor. Uh, you have really raised so much of pointers, and definitely we can have uh, like more than this on discussion on that. We are glad that you are part of our advisory committee, and we will come back to you and take your more inputs. So for sure. now, I just pass the floor to our coordinator, Professor Nirmala, for her concluding remarks. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Radhika. 
And uh, first off, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Rakesh for such an elaborative talk on uh, innovation and public policy. But I'm just seeing that you, uh, we are running out of time, so I will have to uh, I'll very briefly just uh, give, uh, give, uh, just tell you about the whole process. And uh, what I wanted to uh, discuss has already been raised, uh, discussed with Professor Gupta. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, higher education, they are the uh, weakest link uh, uh, in with innovation. And uh, it is really right because uh, uh, students, when they come, they lack, there is lack of passion. And uh, because we have been teaching the graduates and undergraduates, so there is lack of passions. Normally in higher education, when they come to universities, they think about just getting a degree. So doing some research and going as an entrepreneur or starting their own or not looking for a job, but creating jobs. This is this is really out of uh, the, uh, the students who come because we, now it is 30 years since we have in the system. So there is something with, with the uh, students also because it it does not even come into them and just just come for a P, uh, for their degrees at the graduate postgraduate and phd and so it is also for, for from our side i think the teachers that we need to much work more harder because uh, you need to encourage you need to give them something to think about that you can do this so at a very uh, early stage at least in, when they come for graduation bs i talk to them that you can do this yeah, you can you can uh, do research, which can be later. It can be a profession. So this is a linking link from both sides with the students and researchers. And because of the modern technology which has come up, uh, students are much more distracted. So we need to work more harder uh, to make them uh, grasp the topic. So even online, when we talk to them, I, I feel that uh, I have to. Uh, work hard for getting their attention. So this is one which uh, is uh, with higher education institutions. And also when we talk there uh, in universities, we want to do research, but sometimes the funding is a problem and the funding agencies now, uh, uh, they have clubbed the institutes and the institutions. So normally all the uh, funding, they go to the institutions. They are already, Professor Gupta also mentioned, they are elite institutes and what comes down just does a trickle so sometimes we do not even researchers is, uh, the faculty want to do and, and we are not able to get the funds and then ultimately then uh, the interest dies also so there are uh, we have to do a lot about this also so having said that we uh, there is we should always keep on working to make the system grow go much better so thank you uh, professor basant for this we and as radhika told we are very happy that you are in our advisory committee and we will always uh, you, we will always contact you for this and professor gupta he has been a he has been a great support to us and we are still look for he's very busy so we are not uh, he's no, not able to really sit down and talk so we ex we will sit down and talk and see mm -hmm. how we can improve uh, the working of the center and all other uh, ten, uh, participants who are there. And I would like to thank my staff in uh, the center, especially Mamta Bajwa, Radhika and Santosh who have been pushing the pushing and helping in conducting this webinar. So thank you all. And uh, we are, and uh, Professor Basant, we would like that you also have, we have an opportunity, we create an opportunity that you come over to this center. Thank you very much.